speak so that you're not thinking about your presentation the whole time I'm finishing up this chapter. Um, and if that's okay with you. And let me, boom. Okay. And let's go backwards on our list here. So I hope that way, is that going to mess this up? It might actually. I'm sorry, guys. Hold on one second. Tenosynovitis. And, oh, actually that will work okay. We're going to do that. Okay. So we're going to first learn about whiplash. And Miss Belotic is going to tell us all about whiplash, which sounds like a great name for a rock band, now that I think about it. Whiplash! Yeah. So, Miss Belotic, would you be so kind as to explain to us what whiplash is? Can we work on it? I don't know. What is it? Yeah. So, uh, whiplash is a strain in the cervical spine, most common in the fourth and fifth vertebrae. During the forceful event, the head is thrown backwards and forwards rapidly. The upper four clavicle vertebrae acts as the lash, while the lower three are the handle of the whip, hence the name. The surrounding muscles during the event become stretched beyond comfortable capability and become sprained. And then it causes joint trauma, fractures, or concussion. And then while active form formation is present, Treat the area as a local contradiction. Once inflammation is decreased, as you can massage. A massage using myofascial techniques to increase neck flexion. Massage can really help someone improve their mobilization tension and reduce overall pain. Uh, communication with your client is key, and massage can help them physically as well as mentally to ease any trauma from the accident that caused whiplash to occur. That's great. That was really, that was all the stuff we need to know. So, simply put, it's kind of a local contraindication. You guys will get somebody who will literally walk into your office, your home office, or the place you're working at or whatever, and they'll be like, I just got in a car accident, and I want to get a massage because I'm a little bit sore. And you'll be like, no, no, wait two days because because they they could literally have pain later. You could make it worse. But they could also have pain later and blame the massage on it, and instead of it's the car accident, all that kind of stuff. Whiplash usually occurs in car accidents, that's why I was saying that. And it really is the weight of your 8 to 10 pound head. Uh, when you get in a car accident, your head is still moving at 60 miles an hour. And the harness stops your chest. And that's a lot of speed on that. And it whips. Um, it's really good if they get checked out by a doctor first, because the vertebrae in the neck, the cervical vertebrae, can actually hit each other so hard they break. Um, usually that doesn't happen. Usually they've just strained all the fascia that connects the bone to bone in there. What's fascia that connects bone to bone? Ligaments. Ligaments, that's right. And they've stretched all the muscles in there too. So um, once you're checked out by a doctor, massage is really helpful because the neck's going to be stiff and you can slowly kind of increase range of motion and get it moving again so it doesn't kind of lock up. Uh, but I, I wouldn't work on somebody the first two days after they've had a whiplash event. I'd give them two days. And then if it didn't seem too bad, I would work on them without doctor's consent. If they were still getting a lot of pain, I kind of want them to get checked out by a doctor because I'd be worried there's some more serious problem in there. Um, but I'm, I'm not overly cautious, so if it had been two days... And it didn't seem like, they're like, my neck's just stiff. I would work on them. But anyway, local contraindication, right? If it was within the first two days, I would still do a massage on them, but I'm not going to work on their neck. That's a local contraindication, right? Leave the neck alone. Thank you. Good job. Awesome. Um, Torticollis. Miss Cooper, please enlighten us about Torticollis. Oh. But I'm going to show my face because I was listening to everyone, I promise, during our grateful, but I took a shower. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so I and I look weird, but I can explain to you what it is. I'm here. Okay. That was a lot of information, but yes. Tell us about torticollis. <laughs> um, so torticollis is, um, it's when your, the muscles in your neck, um, it's usually in babies when they're first born, like when they're in the womb, but the muscles in your neck 
cause your head to tilt down, like stuck like that. And um, it doesn't just happen in babies though. Um, it can happen after like a car accident or something traumatic. And um, you, you can massage it actually. It really, really helps if it's an adult. Or maybe maybe even you just slept wrong. If you ever just like fall asleep in a weird position and you woke up and you're like, I can't yeah. move my neck. That's sort of helps. Yeah. Is there and another you can definitely massage it? Yes, you you actually can. If it's not inflamed, you can actually massage it. Um, you wouldn't work on a baby. That I that would leave to somebody else. Um, not that you can't work on babies, but I wouldn't be trying to fix something. Oh, no. But on an adult, you can. Um, is does it have another name? Um, the, it's Rynek. Very good. Yeah. Uh, the more common name for it is Rynek. It's technically torticollis, but most people call it Rynek. And you've got these muscles here called your sternocleidomastoid. We're going to talk about them a lot, everybody. They're called your sternocleidomastoid because they go from my sternum, sterno, clavicle, clidal, to my mastoid process, which is this bone back here, this, this process back here on a bone. And it's called, some people call it your SCM, sternocleidomastoid. And that, bow, that muscle, when it contracts bilaterally both sides, it brings my head down. And some people get kind of get tightness and tension in there. And then also Rynek gets used just for people that are hunched over a long time and this gets shortened and they have a hard time straightening out their head. And so massage is actually very effective. We massage it and we slowly stretch it out. Just remember, it's a neck. Like, I don't sit there and try to get you from here to there. Just like if you're trying to touch your toes, I don't shove your back down. But we slowly stretch it out and work it out. And we're just trying to increase flexibility every time. And as long as it, it feels therapeutically uncomfortable to them, which is a term I use with clients all the time, therapeutically uncomfortable is fine. If it hurts, I'm stretching too much. Uh, but wry neck, torticollis, uh, some people kind of call it frozen neck. But anyway, wry neck's more common. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Miss Felix Osuna, you're going to tell us about tension headaches. Um, yes, um, you know, uh, Janice, Miss Janice thought it was funny because I have migraines and it's kind of like not the same thing, but because um, tension headaches are temporal, I guess, and then migraines are kind of crazy. Uh, but the most common headache type it happens to 69 percent of men, but over one minute, 88 percent. Uh, the main causes are muscle tension, elevated or reduced levels of neurochemical serotonin, and dopamine. Yeah. Meaning it's like uh, stresses and all that, you know. Um, other factors are stress, anxiety, depression, contraction of jaw and neck, and um, the shoulders too. <laughs> and also because of lack of sleep. Sorry, my mom. Uh, it can be triggered by chocolate, cheese, only if you're um, allergic to it. Oh. Or, yeah, if you're sensitive to um, yeah. substances. Uh, also, if you overdrink um, coffee, it can also give you a headache. If you drink like one cup of coffee and if you go over that, uh, you can get a headache to what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, um, massaging can help. It helps with like it reduces um how often it happens, but it doesn't reduce the pain of it. If that makes sense. It does make Which sense. Which is pretty cool. Now you don't have to get headaches every single day. Yeah. Uh, um, and using deep effort, cortisol and deep friction reduces tension in the head, neck, shoulder, and back massages too. Yeah. Uh, the muscles are supposed to be massaged so that it can reduce the, the tension. Are the trapezius? Levator scapula, splenic capitis, and the surfaces. Um, that's yeah, the whole bad thing, which is really you know, it reduces headaches with tension or anything. Well, thank you. Uh, that was actually very interesting. Thank you. So tension headaches. Um, you'll have some regular clients that get tension headaches. Mm -hmm. 
And I love what Ms. Felix Osuna said because I agree with it 100%, um, which is that uh, it doesn't often take the pain away for the person right then. By the way, no contraindication. No contraindication. None. So these are, these are people that should be going for massage. But most of them report that it doesn't immediately take away their, their headache, but they report that when they get regular massage, they get less tension headaches. Um, and usually they report a pretty dramatic drop. Like people tell me I used to get three a week and now I get one a month. I mean, if they go for regular massage, it's a big drop and it's worth it to them. And I love it because it's one of those things where it's actually kind of a cure, right? Um, I don't tell them it's a cure, but my point is it's something that dramatically helps where you just rub them because tension headaches come from tension. And so you help them experience less tension. And one of the things that you're trying to do is literally loosen up the tension around their head. And I want you guys to think about something. This is pretty important. What, uh, what joint, there's only one like bone to bone joint that holds your shoulder girdle complex onto your body. Can you guys tell me what that joint is called? Between the sternum and the clavicle? Sternoclavicular joint. It is the sternoclavicular joint. Now, the clavicle, your collarbone, can only actually take an impact of about five pounds of pressure and you can break it. It's not that strong a bone. Um, and yet I can lift up a hundred pounds, all of you, maybe not over your head, but can lift up a hundred pound suitcase and carry it around. So why doesn't your arm just get ripped off your body? Because the shoulders, because of the trapezius, which is a massively powerful muscle, the shoulders actually hang off the back of the head and neck. We think of our neck and head as just, our neck just holding up our head, but it actually is a tent pole. Your head is actually a tent pole to hang your shoulders off of. They really are literally hanging off the back of your head. And so shoulder tension and neck tension run hand in hand. And so I'm telling you this because when somebody comes to you with tension headaches, you are trying to loosen up their shoulders because their shoulders are actually pulling down on their head. Pull, and there's a sheet-like ten, a tendon or sheet-like fascia up here. What do we call sheet-like tendon or fascia? It starts with an A. I always forget. Aponeuroses. Aponeuroses. That's right. Thank you. Aponeuroses. You have like a shower cap, literally like a shower cap, like a swimming cap on your head. And all these muscles attached to it. And if they're all tight, they start to pull down on your brain like this. And then the massage therapist rubs them and then they're all okay. So your shoulders really do hang off the back of your head and neck. Um, and so loosening up that is a big thing that we do in tension headaches. I mean, I would at the bare minimum work somebody from mid back up to here. Of course I'd work the neck, of course I'd work the head, but I'd really be trying to loosen up this whole thing here. Yeah, and it'll make a huge difference for them. Huge. And they'll love you. And they'll come see you every week. And you'll get regular pay from them. And it'll be wonderful. Do you know that if you work on your own, you don't have to work on your own, by the way. A lot of massage therapists do both, whatever. But, but a good weekly client, somebody who comes to see you for, you know, an hour or two a week, uh, it depends. I have to do the exact math. But that person brings, if they're regular, they bring you $5,000 a year. $5,000 a year. If you have 10, 10 cl weekly clients that are coming for two hours a week, that's your whole business. I tell you that, by the way, because if you have a weekly client, think twice before you mess with their time slot. Think twice before you cancel on them. Right? They'll tell you it's okay. They will. But you'll notice they'll start canceling on you a little bit more because you've now said it's okay. And you'll start messing with your income. Do consider that some of your clients... <laughs> bring a tremendous amount of money to the bottom line. If, if they spend $100 a week with you, which is not uncommon for an hour to two hour massage, depending on what you're charging, they're giving you $5,000 a year. You only need 10 clients like that. Like that's your whole business. So I actually do treat people different, by the way, in the massage. If you come to me once a year and you want some special appointment slot, I'm probably not available 
doesn't mean I won't work on you. It's just like you're going to work around my schedule. But if you come to me every week and then you say, hey, my family's in town. Is there any way you can come work on everybody? The answer is always yes. You're a $5,000 client to me. Like you do get special treatment. You are one of 10 people that make up the majority. You are 10% of my business. 10% of my business. It's not like a McDonald's that has, a, you know, a million people coming there a month. So just think about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Epicondylitis. It's fun to say. Miss Hansen is going to tell us all about epicondylitis. And uh, please, please take it away. Epicondylitis is inflammation of the tendon when attached to a bone. You will have pain in the tendons, also swelling or tenderness. The most common and effective region is elbow. Lateral epicondylitis is also known as tennis elbow. You may get tennis elbow if your forearm is used is not used to doing certain activities. Medial epicondylitis is also known as golfer's elbow. Golfer's elbow happens when the muscle in the tendons that control your wrist and fingers have pain. Avoid the affected area while inflammation is present. Once the acute inflammation has subsided, massage can support healing. Yeah, that was actually really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for connecting it to tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Okay, so this is a humerus right here. When you guys learned about this, do you remember what these bumps were called out here? The tippity tip of the bump was called epicondyles. Epicondyles. The, this is a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle. Yeah? And anything that has itis at the end of it means what? Itis? Inflammation. Inflammation. So this is epicondyleitis, inflammation of the epicondyles. Um, and the reason that this is significant is your all your forearm muscles were later going to find all of your forearm muscles attached to either your medial epicondyle or your lateral epicondyle. All of your forearm muscles. Did I mention that all of your forearm muscles attached to either your medial condyle or your, your lateral condyle? Did I mention, by the way, that if you wanted to find any attachment for any forearm muscle, that you would find it around the medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle? Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> um, and it's tension there because of problems happening here. Weaknesses or imbalances or constant strikes like from, uh, from golf or tennis. That's where they got the name golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. So tennis elbow is the lateral epicondyle and golfer's elbow is the... Uh, Medial epicondyle, right? Good, okay. Um, <laughs> I had to check with Miss Hanson. <laughs> um, by the way, lots of people get diagnosed with tennis or golfer's elbow who don't play tennis or golf. But we believe it's a repetitive overuse injury of some sort, right? Um, and you will get clients like that. And, and basically, um, it's not really inflamed. It's not even a local contraindication. You, you can massage it. You can definitely massage all these muscles, right? Because you loosen them up around the elbow and that kind of relieves some of the stuff too. So you will get people come to you. They probably won't say they have epicondylitis. They'll say I've got golfer's elbow or tennis elbow. And you're going to work the heck out of their forearms and even their upper arm. And we'll talk about that more later. But just, just that that's just kind of a, uh, a no-brainer to loosen up those areas. By the way, in general, you loosen up stuff. I mean, that's what you're a massage therapist. So when there's a problem, you try to loosen up stuff to remove tension from those areas. So did you say there was no concern? Um, I'm always hesitant to say that, but I'm, yes, there's no concern. Okay. There's no, there's no, ah, here's my worry. Here's why I he keep hesitating. There's essentially no, by the way, you're not going to do any damage. There's basically no concern. My concern is a little bit right at the epicondyle. It might be really kind of inflamed and you might overrub that one little area. So I, I guess you could call it a local contraindication at that one area. But even there, no, let's call it this. It's a relative contraindication. Use caution. Because well, it sure so isn't dangerous. I'm for my list. That's why I said, for your list. Should I put 
just, just put relative contraindication. A relative contraindication means proceed with caution. Okay. But you could work it. In fact, you probably want to get in there and work those tendons. But relative means I kind of check in with my client. I use some common sense. I don't go to town on you the first session. We see how it felt next session. If it felt better, I'm going to do more of that. Relative contraindication. But you can work it. The whole thing. I'm much happier with that answer. Thank you for letting me. Thank you for letting me go back to the question. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Um, I don't know how common it is for massage therapists, but it definitely is common for massage therapists to get overuse injuries of some kind or another. Yeah. By the way, the big one we see in massage therapy is this. Problems with their thumb. Because massage therapists try to use their thumb as though it was like a fist. They're trying to put all this force of my giant pec and my delts into that little thumb. Thumbs are great, but they're not meant for you to be doing push-ups on them, you know. But yes, you need to take care of yourself. Absolutely. And massage therapists tend to not hurt themselves all at once. They tend to hurt themselves by overusing something for a long period of time. Well said. It's an overuse injury. You know those little tools? Well, I'm sure you know, but the one where your thumb fits in, do those yeah. actually help? They do. I don't like them, but they do. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't like them. I know people use them. Yeah. They do, though. They support your thumb. But I worry that just teaches you to keep using your thumb. And I use my thumb on your neck when I'm up in your neck, but I don't use my thumb to kind of dig in on your back too much because at a certain pressure level, my arm is much stronger than my thumb, and that's the problem. The arm can apply more pressure than the thumb can handle. Yeah. But yes, feel free to play with all those kind of tools. Uh, just remember, by the way, though, if they're like, like electric tools and things like that, some of those things are really neat, like they vibrate the client or whatever. Clients like them, but most clients tell you that they only like it for a little bit because they came to be rubbed. People actually do like to be rubbed. Nothing matches your fingers. There's something truly... Emotionally important about that, physically important about that, and spiritually important about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. Epicondylitis, also known as golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. I love that. Thank you. Um, that was Miss Hanson. Oh, Miss Harper. Miss Harper, will you tell us about tenosynovitis? Tenosynovitis. Yes, sir. Um, The, the fluid what? Fluid filled sheath. 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 By the way, can I just interrupt really quick just so everybody else? It's a hard word to say. I understand. It's got a TH yeah. in it. Tendons, yeah. some tendons have a sheath around them. The tendon has a sheath around it to help it kind of slide across muscle and stuff like that. So it's got like a little, like if you cut a, if you cut a, a hose, a garden hose, and put it over a rope. Like the tendons, the rope, and the garden hose, the little sheath, it helps it slide. And tenosynovitis is inflammation of that sheath. Thanks. Go ahead. I just want to say, because sheath is hard to hear. Yeah. Sheath. Yeah, because I, I have a hard time to say it. Uh, it is the inflammation of the fluid-filled sheath called the synovial. Synovial. Surra yeah. surrounds a tendon, typically leading to a joint pain, swelling, and um, tenosynovitis is not the same condition as tendonitis, which refers to the inflammation of the tendon itself. Yeah. Although, in many cases, the two conditions occur simultaneously. Tenosynovitis can be either infectious or non-infectious. Common clinical manifestations of non-infectious tenosynovitis include Zikver vein, tendinopathy, and ethinosin tenosynovitis, more commonly known as trigger finger. Yeah. The cause of the inflammation in tenosynovitis is not always known, but common cause includes inflammatory disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, infection, injury, overuse, and strain. It typically affects the hands, the wrist, and the feet. The primary, um, the primary treatment tool for tenosynovitis is to reduce pain and inflammation. 
With treatment, most patients will recover with, from, from it within four to six weeks. Okay. If tenosynovitis goes untreated, patients will screaming if the affected joint becomes stiff, inhibiting the tendon become permanently restricted. The studies have shown that um, physical therapy, including stretching and exercise for all forms of tendonitis can help to reduce pain and strengthen the muscles around the damaged tendon to help avoid similar injuries in the future. How about massage? If there is acute inflammation, massage is contraindicated. In subacute stages, massage can help to reduce inflammation and prevent the accumulation of scar tissues. Yeah, thank you. So it's a local contraindication. Local contraindication. Um, so tenosynovitis is inflammation of the sheath over the tendon. Tendonitis is inflammation of the tendon itself. You can often have both together. And to be very honest with you, unless they do an MRI and stuff, doctors often don't know which one's which. It's hard to tell, right? They're just like, you got inflammation in there. Um, and in rubbing directly on it tends to make it a little bit worse, which is why we say it's, it's a local contraindication. You're not going to kill somebody. It's just not helpful. Um, and... It can be an overuse injury where somebody has just used something so much that it's rubbed too much. And it can also be an autoimmune disorder where the body is kind of attacking that area for the wrong reasons and it's inflaming it. And so they'll give you medication and things like that for that. Um, she also correctly pointed out, thank you, that, um, that physical therapy is very helpful because some of this they think comes from weaknesses in other areas. When your muscles are weak, your ligaments and tendons have to kind of take over more. And so strengthening up the supporting areas helps support all that stuff and make it better. So they want to reduce the inflammation, but they also want to strengthen the area. And that's a, that's a really, by the way, that's a really good, like, approach to most bodily problems, right? Kind of deal with the symptoms and reduce those, but build up the strength of the area so we don't have this problem again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So really quick. Um, yeah. So the, that was three separate things, right? Tenosynovitis, tendinosis. But we're just talking about tenosynovitis. Okay, so just that one. Okay. Tenosynovitis. We'll get to tendinosis later. Tenosynovitis. Sorry. Okay, I had just written stuff down, so I didn't know if I did it wrong. Okay, so tenosynovitis. So what was it? Was it uh, local? Uh, yes, it's local. And by the way, I'm sorry. This will help you. There you go. I just okay. share. I just share my screen so you can see the exact things. I apologize. This should be. This should be helpful. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Mr. Kandaris, will you be so kind as to talk to us about strains and what makes them different from sprains? And you're muted. Oh, well, I was talking the whole time. <laughs> He's like, and I'm done. <laughs> All right. So a strain, um, make me remember it easy with the, because the T, like S train, um, just because it's the uh, tendons and um, or muscles. Uh, so basically, uh, sorry, I'm going to draw something out of here that, Um, hold on one second, I'm going to switch rooms. So yeah, sprain affects the ligament, um, which is, you know, bone to bone. Um, and a strain can also be known as like a pulled muscle. Um, there's three different types, so like, of like severity, I guess, and uh, I feel like it can be, it's not a contraindication unless you're kind of at that third uh, level, which can require surgery sometimes. Yeah. Uh, a sprain takes about four to six weeks to heal, um, and 
and yeah, like I said, just with the severity of it, um, like I said, third degree strains are generally require surgical repair. Um, so yeah, uh, for a, a sprain though, it says, and I actually didn't know this term, but I, I know uh, rice, or rest, ice, compression, elevation, but there's one called harm, which is heat, alcohol, running, and massage, which should be avoided for the first 48 to 72 hours after a sprain. Yeah. And uh, typically sprains have been, I mean, they can happen anywhere, you can fall, whatever, but uh, athletes usually get them more often. Um, but yeah, you, you can work on a pulled muscle, just take it easy and wait for, um, you know, wait for some time to go on and uh, if it's super severe, don't because it requires surgery. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, Miss Miss Bonreal, it's a relative contraindication. You proceed with caution. You can you can essentially rub them, um, all of them, really. Uh, he's not wrong. I just meant like he's right. If it's so serious, it needs surgery, but they're not going to be there in that case. You would know. Uh, yes. rel is as long as it feels good to the client, you're fine. You're fine working on it. Um, but let's make sure we all understand the difference. Strains. S T. S T. Strains are muscular related, so they're muscle or tendon. Sprains. S P. <laughs> Sprains. S P. Are ligament related. Ligament related. So. Would you rather have a strain or a sprain? Strain. Sprain? No, strain ST. Strain why? Why ST? Why strain? Because muscle heals quicker than um, ligaments or tendons. Yeah. Why? And by the way, a strain could be a tendon, but you're right. That's where I was heading. Yeah. So a muscular problem is better to have than a ligament problem. You're absolutely right. So... Why does muscle heal faster than ligaments? Mm, the amount of blood? Yes, it's highly vascular. Ligaments are highly avascular without blood. So blood is life and blood makes things repair faster, which is why, by the way, strains respond well to massage because you're bringing more blood to the area. Gentle stretching, massage really helps. Cool. Love it. And just to add to it, yeah. Like, just to be thinking about like ligaments, if it's so bad, you actually end up tearing that ligament. It's definitely in the area that you avoid. Yeah. If it, yeah, that's a sprain. If you had a, well, yeah, that's a, that's not even a sprain. That's a tear. Um, and you will get people that come to you and say, "I have a torn tendon, or a torn ligament, or a torn muscle." One of my first questions is, "Is it a partial tear or a total tear?" I, if, if it's a total tear, I bet they're not there in your office. Total tears are really serious and require surgery to reattach the tear. And there's going to be swelling and black and blue, and it's going to look like something you shouldn't work on. So um, most people have gone to a doctor because they did some little thing, and the doctor goes, oh, you got a little bit of a tear. And the person here is like, Torn muscle. Yes, it's a torn muscle, but it doesn't mean the muscle is torn apart. There's a little tear in it. That's fine. Um, total tears are very different. <laughs> very different. They require surgery. You've got to reattach the tendon or ligament. They're very serious. Okay. Oh, shin splints. Shin splints, Miss Maria. Take it away. Okay, shin splints is um, also known as medial tibial stress syndrome. And um, it is pain that is um, along the medial tibia. And it is from either overuse or maybe during the first few weeks of a new exercise program. So like your body is kind of not used to it. Um, it could be from running or jumping. Um, something that helps is the massage and dorsiflexion 
and plantar flexion. That can be used to stretch the muscle. Um, and they said that while there's inflammation, treat as a local contraindication. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'd agree with that. I don't think you have to be very worried about it. I, I think you could even treat it as a relative. It just depends. If you see inflammation, if you can see the inflammation, meaning you can see that it's hot and swollen, yeah, don't rub anything that's hot and swollen. But if it's not, you can rub it. Um, your calf muscles and a lot of the fascia of the back of your leg attached to that area. And if you guys rub your medial shin right now, you'll notice that it's actually a little bit tender probably. Uh, not because you have shin splints, just because it's a tender area already. I'm talking about the inside of your tibia. So I'm talking about, oh, I can't get it up here. I was going to try to, try to. Talking about if you get the inside of your leg, your lower leg, um, you'll actually feel kind of gristly stuff there where the muscle attaches to the inside of your, your shin. Um, and it's very massageable. And it's usually just that that area has been stressed because somebody started a new activity, as Miss Monreal said. Uh, shin splints is also a, a term that I'm never quite sure what it means when people use it. Because a long time ago, shin splints meant that you actually had hairline fractures in the bones of your shin. A long time ago, it was an overuse injury where you'd been doing so much running that you had hairline fractures in your shin and it was very painful. But what happened is every time people had pain in their shin, they started calling it shin splints. Um, and the fact is the majority of time they had pain in their shins, it was from exactly what Ms. Monreal is talking about. It was just the muscle there from a new activity and things like that just being sore. And... They did that so commonly that the term is actually changed now to mean kind of muscle soreness down in your, your shin instead of hairline fractures in your shin. So when somebody comes in and tells me they've got that, I, I generally work on those areas and just check in with them. They usually want you to work on those areas. Um, little rule of thumb, inside of legs can take less pressure than outside of legs. Inside of arms can take less pressure than outside of arms. Outside of your arms are thicker skin, and think about it, you bump up against stuff. Look at the inside of my arm, it's all soft and white, You right? This is actually more tender skin. Inside of your legs, same thing. Up your thighs and your leg, your lower leg. So why is it more tender though? Uh, I think for a number of reasons. The skin is thinner on the inside, right? Um, those areas don't get touched as much. You bump into stuff with the outside of your legs. You bump into stuff with the outside of your arms. You don't bump into stuff in the inside of your arms and the inside of your legs, right? So the nerves are more sensitive in those areas too. I just think they're less protected. You're, you're built that way. Yeah. And so I tend to use less pressure on the inside of arms and the inside of legs. I have a question. Yes. If someone comes in with shin splints and they really are torn, do you, can you still massage those? Yeah, they're not going to be really, I mean, I shouldn't say not because then something like, but to, t to if you don't see swelling there, go ahead and do it. And by swelling, I meant really like a puffy kind of look. And if, and if it feels therapeutically painful to them, that's fine. And that's the term I use, therapeutically painful, where they're like, oh yeah, it kind of hurts, but it's a good hurt. That's fine. You're not going to, the, the, the connection of the calf back there is so massive that there's no way they pull their calf off. They'd be dead. They really would be dead. So you don't have to worry about it. They might have minor, tiny little tears, but you work on people all the time with tiny tears and don't know it. So that's fine. Yeah. Just, so did you say relative or did you say no concern? I'm thinking. I don't want to overdo contraindications because you can actually get too cautious massage therapist. Uh... No, no contraindication. By the way, I hope everybody understands, though, I'm still going to massage to my client's comfort level, right? Like, you're always, if it hurts them, that's a, but I don't think you have to call it a contraindication. I'm not worried about you doing damage by doing it. So, therefore, there is no contraindication. But it should still feel therapeutically good. People can actually feel when something's therapeutic, as opposed to when it just hurts. Cool.
So yes, thank you for checking in. Thank you for uh, making me make a decision, Ms. Monreal. It's important. You guys need clarity. You deserve that. Uh, yeah, don't worry about shin splints. Rub them. They need it. You're going to get athletes all the time that are going to come to you. Runners, things like that. Normal people. And, and it feels great. It's awesome. They're going to love it. They're going to feel better. Those are your clients. Uh, um, I do have a question. I'm sorry about don't be sorry. the um, ligament damage. Yes. So there is still a certain amount of blood that goes to ligaments though, right? Yes. Thank you for asking that. I was almost going to clarify it. I didn't want to beat a dead horse, so to speak. Um, vascular means blood. Avascular means without blood. But there's nothing in your body without blood because anything without blood dies, period. So really, really what they mean is muscles are highly vascular. They get lots of blood. And ligaments get little bits of blood. They just get less. because, And the reason they get less is they're so thick and so dense, it takes longer for blood to get in there. But nothing in your body is without blood because it would die. I mean, truly die, become brittle, wither away, die. So everything, even something that we say is avascular, gets blood. Yes. Um, period. So thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. So A does mean without, and vascular does mean blood, and it does mean without blood, but it's a lie. It means without a lot of blood. Yeah. Thank you for asking. That's a huge point to make. And again, really quickly, muscle's all soft. That's why you guys like eating steak, right? Muscle's all soft and it gets lots of blood gets into it. It's like a big sponge. And so it heals really fast. But steaks aren't that strong, right? But that saran wrap stuff, that stuff's strong, but it's really dense. So blood has a hard time getting into it. So you can either repair really fast, but tear really easy, or repair really slow, but have a very really hard time tearing. And your body has made this decision that if it's going to tear, it's going to, you know, tear in this one area and it tries to keep the other stuff preserved. You'd rather actually have a muscle tear first before you have a ligament tear anyway. One more question then. Yeah. So as far as ligaments in healing, does it still create scar tissue like there would be in muscle? Like you have scar tissue on a ligament or a... Oh. I don't know. I, I've never okay. thought about that. You're... These are great questions. My guess is no, and here's why. But it's a guess, but it, but the answer is still good. So my guess is no because scar tissue is fascia. Right. True. So collagen. Right. So right. so really when you have scar tissue in a muscle, it's almost like you've got a little ligament sewn into the muscle in that area, right? Or a tendon sewn in the muscle in that area. Or whatever you want to call it, aponeurosis sewed in or whatever. But you've got a little bit of gristle in there. You've got gristle in there. Well, the ligament already is gristle. The only exception that, that I'm guessing is, would the ligament form slightly differently if we looked under a microscope? Would there be like different angles on stuff where you could tell it was ruptured at some point possibly but it's going to be repaired with the same stuff that it's made out of whereas the muscle might actually get repaired with stuff that it's not mainly made out of you might replace muscle tissue with fascia your body's doing that so it doesn't tear again but the problem is you now have an area that is no longer muscle and that happens all the time so i think that answered your question yeah and, but your question was brilliant because it, we're really just discussing, like, the difference between fascia and muscle. And scar tissue is fascia. It's your body saying, you are an idiot, and you tore this muscle, or you tore this piece of skin, or you tore this thing, and I'm going to sew it back together with something that's stronger than it was before, which is fascia. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, that brings us to Miss Nguyen who is going to tell us about plantar fasciitis. So first, can we practice saying plantar fasciitis first? Can I do it with you? Yeah, I can tell that. Okay. Um, so plantar. And um, plantar and the plantar, plantar and the... Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Stop. Stop uh, one second. Stop uh, one second. Uh, Stop. Yeah. Stop. Let's just, I want to say it though with you. First say plantar. Plantar. Perfect. Now, fash. Fash. Eitis. Eitis. Yeah. Plantar fasciitis. 
Yes, it is. It's in the foot. Plantar is the bottom of your foot. Remember the plantar region? Yep. Thank you. Stretching? No, broaching. Broaching. I don't know what word you're using. I'm sorry. Okay, I show you. Please do. I'm sorry. Same thing in the people. Oh, bowstring. I know what you're trying to talk about. You're okay. So Miss Nuyen is actually talking about a really cool concept. Um, so can you guys pin me for ju just one second, Miss Nuyen, because I want to explain this to them so they know what you're talking about. So can you guys see the the board here? Pin me for a second. Okay. If this is my knee and this is my leg. And this is my foot, okay? It's hard to imagine, hold on, my phone is going off and it needs to stop, okay. But we have tendons and ligaments that actually go underneath your foot and go up the back here. And this essentially makes kind of a bow and arrow effect. A bow, and, that was a terrible arrow, but a bow and arrow effect to your foot. And it's one of the ways you have springiness in your foot. You've got kind of stuff from here to here and it creates a springiness. It creates a bow and arrow effect. Um, and it's one of the ways you can bounce around and all sorts of stuff. It's amazing. And anyway, but it puts stress on the fascia of your plantar region. Take it away. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes, and yeah. And, uh, and making the heel pain because in the because uh then pasta and make in the tissue tissue and uh, having the cancer and imprint. What was the last thing you said? Uh, I say the tissue making the tissue and making the cancer cancer and imprint. Yeah, it causes pain. There's no doubt about it. Uh, 
how to say that. I don't, know. I, I don't know what that word is. But I know what you're saying. I'm going to summarize all this, by the way, in a second. Yeah. I, I mean, the, when, uh, when is the better not to my pain, you can massage oh, yeah. the deep tool for massage over uh, cold in the muscle can, can be. Uh, I show you, so... Thank you. I'm sorry about my voice. No! This is great. Oh, cramping. I'm so sorry. I heard you say camping, and I was like, I can't understand what camping has to do with this. I should have put an R in there. Cramping. Cramping. R's are hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, quick in the... With mobilization. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and sell with the stretching. Yeah, stretching. Yeah. Yeah. In in pool in pool for. It'll improve. I think the big pain is go away. Mm -hmm. Help for that. Must I help for that? Yeah. Cool. But if if in the very pain you can't massage for in the pool, but you need to be very be careful. You yeah. only do when you in the better. You only do in the the. In the outside, uh, I don't know how to say that. But yeah, superficial. I that. Yeah. Okay. Can I? I'm gonna. I'm gonna summarize this. I am gonna put a little bit of my own opinion in here, uh, because I believe this is not even a relative in, uh, contraindication. And here's why I want to say that, because somebody else would come along and say, yes, it is a relative contraindication. Um, I'm going to say it's not a relative contraindication because you can't do any damage really massaging in the area and somebody won't let you touch it if it hurts too much. They just won't. So I'm not worried about you doing something wrong to somebody. If it feels good, it is good, which is the rule of most massage. And if they're like, no, it's just too painful, don't touch it, then you'll just stop. They won't let you. Like, So I don't even consider this a contraindication because I'm not worried about you making a mistake. That's why I say no contraindication whatsoever. Um, that doesn't mean that you sh you might have to go light, right? Because the person might say go light. That's perfect. Like the their feedback can be trusted on this, how their feet feel. So you have fascia that we've been talking about, fascia everywhere on the bottom of your feet. It actually wraps up the muscles on the back of your leg, and it's what gives you the springiness when you walk. Itis means what? What's itis? Inflammation. Plantar is what region of the body? Foot. Foot. And thank you. And fascia is the connective tissue we've learned about. So this is inflammation of the fascia of the bottom of your foot. Plantar fasciitis. It is in general an overuse injury. So people that run too much, and it's it's really that they don't have enough rest time between their runs over a long period of time get plantar fasciitis. People with too much weight sometimes get plantar fasciitis because it's getting stretched here. Flexibility issues can lead to it too because this area is already under a lot of tension. Um, it tends to hurt people more in the morning when they get up because they're kind of stiff and their feet are, are cold then. As they warm up during the day, they tend to get a little bit better. Um, so, but, but again, the next day it it's bothers them again. Um, it can be extremely painful for people. People either love having it massaged or they don't. Massage does seem to really help it if they can stand the massage. Um, and if they can't, it's probably not a good time to massage them right then. Um, anything that you do to stretch out the leg and open up the calves and all this stuff here helps them. So it is essentially a stretching, massaging sort of thing. Um, if they need it really light, you do do a superficial massage and you don't dig down in. As they can handle more and more pressure, it is okay to dig in there. It really is. They get pain in the heel, but they often get pain throughout the entire foot. The reason the heel is so common is it's the, it's the bow of the bow and arrow. And so that, that's why they often feel a lot of tension there because that's where everything's coming together. But they'll feel it all the way up to their toes sometimes. It's a burning sensation. Kind of like if you've ever stretched too far and you get that burning sensation, it's a burning sensation. Uh, it's painful. You've got a lot of sensors in your feet. 
Um, and as, as you can imagine, having a hard time walking is quite debilitating. Great massage client to have, though. Great massage client to have. And no real risks. Nothing really to worry about. Thank you. Good job. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Let us go on and talk about Osgood Schlatter disease. Osgood Schlatter disease by Miss Petrie. Take it away. said your your book calls it i think a local contra contraindication but i'm with you on this one too the problem is actually behind the kneecap and so it's really hard to reach the problem itself anyway right. you you can massage this assuming it feels well to them i wouldn't even call it a relative contraindication unless by the way you call everything a relative contraindication like and that's the other way i look at stuff everything is a relative contraindication i should treat everybody different differently and i should make sure that everything feels good to every client so in that sense, it's relative. But yeah, there's nothing to worry about here. Um, and you really do loosen up the calves and the thighs where the knee comes together, front and back, to relieve pressure in this area. That's one of the big things you do. And it is usually an overuse uh, injury, and so they need to kind of stretch and rest. And I want to back up for one second because I didn't tell you that about plantar fasciitis, by the way. All the massage in the world won't take it away. They also have to run less lose some weight, whatever's causing it to begin with too, right? But this is an overuse injury, and it's, we normally see it in younger people. We think it's because they're growing so fast and they're overusing these areas. So you'll see it like young soccer players, in case you have a young soccer player in your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, but nothing, nothing really to kind of worry about. Um, and it's not... In my opinion, it's not usually a problem for young soccer players and stuff like that. If, if when it starts to occur, you kind of say, hey, we need to rest some then, and we need to be doing less activity until it gets better. It's when people kind of try to work through it that it becomes a problem. Inflammation, inflammation of tendons and ligaments, you can't work through it. They have to rest at some point. Not all the time, like you still want to use them, but they ha you have to reduce the, the level of stress on them. You can't just force your way through it. It's not a mental problem, right? Cool. Thank you. Very helpful. Oshlaughter disease. I love it. Uh, Miss Stanley, what the heck is myofascial pain syndrome? What does myofascial even mean? Let me tell everybody really quick. So we all know what fascia is, right? Yeah. Myo means muscle. And so you will, the reason I'm making a big deal about this is you will hear people talk about like, I'm a myofascial therapist. I would describe myself that way, right? I'm working on the muscle and the fascia. It's just a more correct term. 
You guys, you guys are myofascial therapists. You're not just working on muscle, you're working on fascia. And so we'll talk about myofascial stuff because you can't separate fascia and muscle anyway. So myo means muscle, fascia means fascia. Okay, take it away. Disorder in which pressure on sensitive points and muscles causes pain in seemingly unrelated body parts. And it often occurs after repeating an injury or muscle overuse. Approximately 14% of the population will develop a persistent form of myofascial pain syndrome. It's, it's both, it's equally like between male and females. There's no one gets it more than the other. It's, same for everybody. And it's very common in people with FMS, which you will learn shortly after you learn this. Yes. For us. Um, when, but when massaging, it's, it's mostly important to avoid deeper tissue massaging. It's not exactly a contraindication really at all. It just says to be careful of deep pressure, obviously avoid endangerment sites, especially, like, don't put, like, any pressure on it, basically. And, but you can do light to, like, medium massages. Basically, it's up to the client. Yeah. If they tell you they're fine, they're fine. If, not, if you hit a spot that hurts, avoid it. Yeah. Well said. Well done. Anything else? You don't need to. I'm just asking. I didn't want to cut you off. No. Good. That's all I would have said, too, by the way. All right, so everybody, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more after we hear about fibromyalgia. But Miss Monreal, there is no contraindication whatsoever for uh, myofascial pain syndrome. I mean, again, if it hurts somebody, back off and do less. But there is no contraindication. There's no danger whatsoever. Uh, Miss Torres, can you tell us about fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia syndrome. And then I'm going to talk about both after we're done. Yes, I can. Okay, so um, fibromyalgia is also known as FMS. It's a chronic condition. It is an imbalance in the uh, in the way that uh, um, autonomic nervous system responds to the physical or even physical social stress. Yeah. Um, some of the most common symptoms are muscle pain and tenderness, but there are also other symptoms like Tender points, joint stiffness, fatigue, non-refreshing sleep, um, and mood problems. They um, so um, there there are no signs of inflammation or generate degeneration of the tissue. And it could be di diagnosed after three months of, um, of it. Yeah. They are, they are different types. They are uh, of pain, which are the chronic, diffuse, sharp, or severe. Sure. And it could, it could, or it can occur at night. And the whole body could be fatigued, fatigue as well. There are there are uh, muscle soreness, um, muscle spasms. You could have um, back, neck, and abdomen pain as well. Um, other symptoms are depression, headaches, 
So it consists in a lot of pain. Like there's pain everywhere I get. It, it also um, messes up with your mood. So it creates, it creates um, anxiety, mood swings, um, forgiveness, lack of con concentration. So yeah, there's a lot of things they, they recommend. Actually the doctors recommend massage as the number one um, therapy, but it, it has to be applied slow and, and gently. And it will help um, to improve sleep. Um, let me see. So 80 to 90% of the cases that are diagnosed are from women. So yeah, it's a really high percentage. And I think it has to do because we get stressed out really fast. I don't know. It could be. Um, but yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia syndrome. I'm talking about both right now because I lump them together. Myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia syndrome. Um, you will have somebody come to you and say, I've got fibromyalgia. You'll have lots of people come to you and say they've got fibromyalgia. Or myofascial pain syndrome is kind of a newer term, but anyway. Um, they, there are no contraindications for these. None. Uh, massage is the number one treatment for both of these. Doctors have no idea what causes it. They'll tell you that it has something to do with the way the nerves aren't getting pain signals to the right area and it's causing other problems and blah, 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 blah. It's a guess. They have no idea. These are both diagnosed based on their symptoms. Let me be very clear what that means. That means you come to them and say, I hurt, and they say, well, I hurt here, here, and here, and I've been hurting for a couple of months, and they go, it's fibromyalgia. Normally, when we diagnose something, like if you say I've got coronavirus, they give you a test to see if you've got coronavirus, right? This would be like you coming to somebody and saying, I've got a cough and a fever, and they'd say, well, it's coronavirus. They don't know that. They don't know what causes fibromyalgia or um, myofascial pain syndrome which means it could be even several different causes because they're, they're labeling it just by the symptoms. I'm not picking on doctors, by the way. What I'm trying to just tell you is they don't know. And what they found is it's a kind of an achy syndrome. And, uh, and yes, by the way, there are different types. Some people get sharp shooting pain. Some people get long throbbing pains, whatever. Uh, quite often, by the way, they can be anywhere, but quite often through this trapezius area, the neck and shoulders, common tension areas. And it is interesting that it strikes women more than men. Um, and, and I have a personal theory about that. But, but the fact is, massage responds to it very well because it seems to be tension-related. It seems to be tension-related. And these people have no relief. Nothing helps them except massage, pretty much. And so it's very helpful because when you're in pain, you don't sleep well. And when you don't sleep well, you actually have extra tension. And I don't just mean tension here. Your muscles get more tense. And when your muscles get more tense, you get more pain, which means you get less sleep, which means you get more tension, which means you get more pain. And by the way, all the stuff Ms. Torres said is true too. When I have more pain, I don't treat my spouse as well as I should, which gives me more tension, which gives me more pain, which gives me less sleep, which whatever. Not just your spouse, by the way, your kids, your job, whatever. I'm just trying to give you a common thing. And what helps with tension and the pain? Massage. And so we can start to break this cycle. And finally, they get a good night's sleep. And as their sleep improves, the fibromyalgia seems to go away. Um, so what is your personal theory? Mm, I was hoping you'd ask. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't going to shove down your throat. Two things. One is um, women in our society have a much greater burden to bear than men. And I'm not trying to pick on the men, myself and Mr. Kandaris. Um, I think we're both wonderful men, but I honestly think women have a much bigger burden to bear. Men have a lot of pressure to maybe bring home the bacon, right? To That's kind of how we're judged, by how well our career is going and things like that, in general. And that's it. Women are supposed to work a full-time occupation, be a fantastic mother, be a great cook, be sexy, stay thin, 
do all these things. You've got 35 things you're supposed to do. And they compete with one another. Nobody can work a full-time job and take care of kids full-time. It cannot be done. And yet, we never expect guys to do that. We expect women to do that. That's just one example. And the pressure is unbelievable. And I think the pressure gives you a lot of tension. You know? And I think you care, too, which is great. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I had a mother who cared. It really helped. But it causes a lot of that. And the other thing is because they are trying to do everything, you gals don't get enough sleep. And when you don't get enough sleep, you start to get tension. And you start to hurt. And you start the cycle. So I'm making this big feminist speech <laughs> because I, I want you to all give yourselves permission to not do everything, to not have to do three times what a man has to do, you know, and I commend you. I really do. It's a very hard society to be a, a woman in, um, and you're constantly shown images of perfect women all over the place that are somehow doing it all, uh, and they're not real. And so, anyway, I really commend you. Um, but I think it puts you under a lot of pressure, and I honestly think that's why you come up with what I really think myofascial, my uh, myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia are is just tension headaches in your body, right? Just your body responding to that. Uh, and I don't think that's a crazy far out idea. You know, I think that's a pretty, pretty, pretty easily explainable. I'm not like some mystical, you know, kind of massage idea. Anyway, that's my thing. Thank you for letting me rant about that. Um, Miss Yanez, can you tell us about Dequervian tenosynovitis, and let me know if I'm saying Dequervian right. Dequervian? Dequervian. Uh, yeah, I said Dequervian. Dequervian. I know it's tenosynovitis. So, anyway, Dequervian tenosynovitis, what is that? Uh, Dequervian tenosynovitis, or also tendinitis, it's those two can be more commonly known as texter's thumb or mother's wrist. And it's an inflammation of the tendon sheath located on the radial side of the wrist, and it goes up into the thumb. Um, it's often related to a repetitive motion injury. So I was kind of thought of like, if you spent all day cutting paper with scissors, that'd be one or texting. Texting, yeah. Um, or it can, also be from sustained weight bearing while the wrist is in a static or locked position. So like carrying a child on one hip. Oh. Um, and when it's inflamed, it's a local contraindication, but if not, it's totally fine to massage. Um, it just says to use light FR strokes and friction movements and slowly increase the pressure to what your client wants and don't overstress the yeah. stretch the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Uh, gamers, absolutely, Miss Petrie, and, and texting and all that kind of stuff. It's an overuse uh, injury, and we see a lot of it now because some people really text a lot. Um, I used to have a high school class for massage, and I, I loved them, but oh, my God. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> um, anyway, it, it's tendonitis, basically, right? It's tendonitis in your thumb kind of area. Um, she said on the radial side, let me explain that term. I've got two bones in my arm. One is my ulna and one is my radius. And my radius runs to my thumb always. So the radial side is the thumb side. We'll talk about it more when we do forearms. So I just want to kind of explain stuff. I'm hoping you hear this stuff before we talk about it later. That's why I'm always trying to drop little bits of stuff in there just so you kind of get used to hearing it. But anyway, okay, yeah. So oversimplification, but tendonitis of the thumb. Oversimplification. And yeah, you can work it as long as it's not a big problem going on there. Um, if anything, it's a local contraindication, yeah, of that little area. But it really helps to loosen up the forearms and all this kind of stuff in this area and kind of help it out. They also have to stop doing whatever they're doing to hurt the thumb in the first place. You guys aren't miracle workers, you know. You gotta, I can't make up for bad habits completely. Okay. Uh, quick comment. Please, comment away. Uh, so you said it was on the side of the thumb? Yeah. Well, I, it's on the thumb side. Yeah. So you've got, you've got eight muscles that feed your thumb, that move my thumb around. And 
Four of them live here, and four of them live on my arm right here on the radial side. And so that's where the problems kind of occur. Okay, because, like, I, I do play games, and uh, I haven't experienced much hand tension until actually about two days ago, but it was on, uh, it was on like, my pinky side, so I got a controller. Like, so see how I'm gripping it like this? Yeah. It was, like, all in here, kind of like in the pinky on the other side. It was just kind of tense, like I don't know, it felt weird. I, that, that would be, so that doesn't mean you have that, but that, that would be the first, first sign, right? And if you kept doing that and kept bothering you, you might be heading towards that. Okay. So yeah, we're going to have that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. By the way, I said there's eight thumb muscles. Do you want a little trick on how you can, in a way, kind of remember all eight of them? Yeah. Just want to make sure I'm spelling it right. P O L L I C I S. P-O-L-L-I-C-I-S spells polysis. Polysis essentially means thumb. And every single thumb muscle has the word polysis in it. So even if I forget one of my eight thumb muscles, because they've got all sorts of names, right? If somebody is talking to me, and they're like, blah, 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 blah. And they're trying to show off their anatomy. And they're like, you know, because sometimes you get doctors coming to you. Blah, 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 I know that they are talking about a muscle in this area or in this area. And I don't let them know that I don't know exactly which one. <laughs> I know they're talking about a thumb muscle. And I'm like, well, we're going to loosen up this whole area. But the polysis instantly set it off right away. And then they're impressed because I grab their hand. And I'm like, okay, let's start working on this. And they're like, oh, this guy knows his muscles. And really, I just remember that polysis is in the name of every single thumb muscle. And by the way, it's always that way. So it's not used in any other muscular name in the body. If, the, if, if a muscle name has the word polysis in it, it's in this area, and it's one of the eight muscles, and it's going to the thumb every time. Every time. Can we, can we do the very last one? Oh, where's, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. No, don't be sorry. I'll, I'll let you do that. Yeah, don't be sorry. Um, but, yeah. So, anyway, polysis, that's a really helpful thing to know. By the way, really quick. Um, holosis, H-A-L-L-U-C-I-S. Is big toe muscles. You have seven big toe muscles. They all have holosis in it. And anything in your body that has holosis in it goes to the big toe every time. So when I hear blah, 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 muscle, blah, 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 polysis, thumb stuff. Blah, 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 holosis longus, holosis brevis, holosis adductor, holosis flexor, holosis extentor, big toe. Every time. Works every time. 15 muscles. Essentially covered right there. <laughs> we will use that again, but it's a very helpful thing. Okay, uh, I do agree with Miss Monreal that we need a break, but let's let's do this last one here. Miss Hunter, would you be uh, Miss Hunter? You're awesome. She's like she's trying to like get dueling dueling internet connections so that she can deliver here. Can you tell us about uh, tendonitis and tendinosis? They sound so similar. Tendonitis and tendinosis. What can you tell us? Can you? Yes. Oh, you can me? We can hear you. Hey. Sort of. Uh, I, 
maybe? Yeah, I think you got a bad connection. I'm sorry. Um, and I think you've done a very valiant job at trying to overcome it. <laughs> well, I can hear you clearly, which is interesting. Well, now I can hear you clearly, too. Uh, um, I can, oh, you still can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, then I will quickly hurry up and do it. Tendinosis is a degeneration of the tendon's collagen in response to chronic overuse, such as clicking a mouse. Um, that could, um, cause, clicking a mouse repeatedly can cause it. Uh, tendinitis, also known as tendontis, is the inflammation of the tendon, um, and it happens when a person overuses or injury or, or injures their tendon, like during a sport. Um, and it is um, linked to acute injury with inflammation. Um, uh, for both of these, it occurs in the elbow, uh, wrist, finger, um, and other parts of the body, but mostly it's in the hand. Um, uh, massage is um, not committed in the injury or the issue with acute. Um, but when it is, uh, okay, yeah, when it is um, uh, afterward, after it's the acute phase, um, it is uh, highly uh, recommended. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Thank you. It's weird. The more you talk, the, the better you came in. It's like the, you finally got linked up. Okay, so everybody, really quickly, tendonitis you're going to hear about all the time. Tendonitis is inflammation of the tendon. And, uh, and, and it's a relative contraindication. Tendonitis is a relative contraindication. Just be careful when you're working it. Inflammation of the tendon, you're going to hear about all the time. Tendinosis is a local contraindication. Tendinosis is actually a degeneration, a breaking down of the tendon. It's a much more serious problem. The tendon is starting to degenerate for some reason, and that's why we don't want to mess with it, because we're not sure why it's degenerating and things like that. Um, so tendinosis is a local contraindication. Avoid that area. Um, and again, you probably wouldn't make it worse, but it's just not good to mess with. Uh, so it's not something I'm terrified about. But anyway, but tendinitis, inflamed, irritated, tendinosis actually breaking down. And on that note, I think we really should take a break and I will tell you what, let's take a 10-minute break. We will come back at 9.55, but please be back on time. 9.55, 9.55. See you then. So yesterday when we left our intrepid explorers, we were hammering some concepts into your head, right? And we talked about like, like the entire leg really, for example, or entire arm or something like that. We talked about like groups of muscles even. And, and we talked about what those might be covered with, what kind of fascia might cover those, and that smaller groupings of muscle fibers might have this around there, and even smaller groupings of muscle fibers might have another type around there. And then we talked about the individual muscle fiber, and we said that's really actually a muscle cell. And then we talked about the muscle cells full of all these little railroad cars called sarcomeres, and that inside those are the thick and thin filaments um, that actually grab onto one another. And, and one's made out of myosin, and the other one's made out of actin, and they pull each other together, and that's what creates a, a contraction, which is the only thing a muscle can do. Correct? Awesome. Yeah? Do you guys feel like you have that part, kind of like what I just kind of ran through, in your head? Yeah? All right. Ms. Giannis, I don't want to punish you for looking confident, but you look pretty confident. And so, help us out here. What's the top layer of um, a fascia called? Epimysium. Epimysium, epimysium. Cool. Epimysium 
goes down to a smaller layer of fascia. Paramycium. Paramycium goes down to a smaller layer of fascia. Last layer. Endomycium. Endomycium. That's surrounding a single muscle fiber. A single muscle fiber is also known as a single muscle cell. Muscle cell. Inside that muscle cell are a whole bunch of these little units that are contracting units. They're called contracting units. And what's their name? Sarcomere. Sarcomere, sacromere, yes. And inside those contracting units, the things that actually make them contract are these things. What's inside them? Thick and thin myofilaments. Wow, that was fantastic. Yeah, that's more than one. Yes, thick and thin myothin filam uh, filaments. <laughs> you said even better than I did. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, what are the thick and thin filaments made out of? What two proteins? Do you remember? I'm, I'm pushing my luck here, but. Uh, the thin is actin and the thick is myosin. Yeah. Yep. And what happens? Do you remember the ion that we can shoot in there that will make them contract? Calcium. Yeah, calcium ion. Thank you. By the way, did you guys notice? That was fantastic, perfect, thank you. Did you guys notice that every time I asked Miss Giannis something, she did this? It's almost like she's looking at notes. Hmm. Note taking. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you for taking notes. Thank you for referring to your notes. I don't want it up here. I want it kind of, I want you to understand it and be looking down at it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now do we kind of have that? Yeah? Maybe? Sort of? Yeah. Yeah. Miss Harper. I know. I know. It's not fair. You don't look like you have it. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. Miss Harper, what's the top layer of fascia called? Epimycium. Epimycium, yeah. Hey, I just thought of something. What's the top layer of skin called? The, the uh, thing above the dermis? Oh, epidermis. Epimycium epidermis. Top layer of fascia, top layer of skin. Interesting. Okay. Must be a coincidence. Anyway, epimycium, what's the next layer? Yeah, paramycium. Yep. What's the last layer? The end layer? Endomycium. Yep. That's around a muscle fiber. What's a muscle fiber? Uh, muscle cells. Yeah. Uh, the contracting units inside the muscle cell that are all hooked together by Z lines are called what? The sarcomers. Yeah! Inside the sarcomers, the thing that actually pulls the Z lines together that actually make, lets them contract are what? Uh, that's the thin and thick filaments. We'll take it. Thin and thick filaments, absolutely. They're made out of what? They're made out Yes, those two proteins, which is why proteins make up muscle. Oh my God. Okay, what is the ion that I have to inject in here to to uh, to make it actually contract? There's an ion that goes in here. Uh, I forgot. I forgot. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a drink of milk here because it's well, it's got a lot of things in it that are good for you, like calcium. And you just think about it. Oh, calcium. Oh, good. Calcium ions go in there. Uh, cool. So calcium's not just good for your bones. Calcium ions are good for muscle contraction. Interesting. Very cool. That was a fantastic job, by the way. Thank you for letting me call you out. I really appreciate it, and you did really good. Um, and it would have been okay if you did really bad, because we're all here just to learn. So that's fine. But good job. Really nicely done. Cool. Okay. Let's, let's move on. Yeah? All right, let's see here. Uh, we already talked about myo, my means muscle. Boom, boom, boom. Um, all right, really quick review here. Miss Monreal, uh, what is the skeletal system? Like, what is it? Um, like, what is it or what does it do? No, what, it, what is it, not what does it do? Like, what's it composed of? Oh, bones, ligaments, and joints. Oh, oh my God, I feel so terrible. You are right. I need more coffee. I am so sorry for giving you a question that's not even on the topic today. I saw skeletal on my slide, and I literally just slipped to a different lecture in my brain. I'm old and feeble. Okay. Okay. No wonder you're like, what are you talking about? Okay. So this is why you shouldn't drink in the morning. All right. So... <laughs> So, can you tell me what makes up the muscular system? 
the one we're studying. Muscles and tendons yeah. and fascia? Yeah. Muscles, tendons, fascia. We'll take it. Thank you. Okay. Woo. And the, can you tell me the three types of muscle that there are? They should be on the slide. Smooth, that, um, uh, well, I know the heart's one, but what is that? Like, cardiac. Oh, cardiac. And it should be on the slide right now, kind of. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, smooth. Wait, but that's that's two. Cardiac and smooth. What's the third? What's the one that hooks to the skeleton? What do oh, we call skeletal. it? Skeletal. Oh yeah, cool. No, you don't have to be off with the whole other thing. I I'm yes. I'm I'm shocked we got any answer out of you after what I did to you. Alright, so the skeletal system is essentially composed of muscles and associated structures like tendons and aponeuroses. There are three types of muscle skeletal, smooth, cardiac. Skeletal is anything that hooks to a bone. It's what we study all day long because that's what makes your bones move. Yeah, yeah. Um, smooth is wrapped around all the inner linings of your body. It actually is around your arteries and veins so it can open and close them. Um, and cardiac is your heart. Your heart is a muscle. People always say that. It's part of the muscular system. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for making things worse. Okay, we're just kind of reviewing here a little bit. Um, we talked yesterday about tonus. Tonus was muscle tone. It's the fact that my muscles right now are contracting just a little bit all over the place to keep me upright. Muscle tone. Muscle tone or tonus is actually how you're sitting in your chairs right now. It doesn't matter. You use it all the time unless you are laying on a bed not moving anything. Then you shouldn't have any muscle tone at that point. But some people still do because we're tense. Um, thermogenesis. Anybody want to take a stab at what thermogenesis means? What does thermo mean? We didn't talk Heat. about this. What? Heat. Yeah, or temperature, therms, oh. temp. But heat, we'll take heat too. Heat. And what's Genesis? What's what's the book of the Bible Genesis about? The beginning? Or creation. Oh, okay. So take heat, creation. It's your muscle's ability to generate heat, to create heat. Heat generation. Thermogenesis. It's just a term people use. And I didn't talk about it yesterday because we had too many other things going on. But that's called thermogenesis. Therm, like a thermometer, measures temperature and uh, measures heat. Actually, you're, you're probably more right than I am now that I think about it, Ms. Monreal. Um, and genesis is to generate. So heat generation. Cool. All righty. Um, I'm going to skip by this because we already talked about it and it's going to get more confusing. Don't forget that your skeletal muscle, by the way, is striated muscle. Your skeletal muscle is striated muscle because of the way all the fibrils stack and stuff. Don't even worry about that, but it's striated. It's got stripes in it. And they actually refer to it as striated muscle. Your smooth muscle is not striated. Your skeletal muscle is striated muscle. Some people actually call it striated, which is the only reason I'm making a big deal out of this. Will it affect your massage career whatsoever? Probably not. Like you, it's, it, But people will sometimes talk about it as striated muscle. It means striped. It looks striped. Striated muscle, moving right along. Do do do. We did all this cool stuff. Uh, we talked about muscles, tendons, aponeuroses, and retinacula. Yesterday we discovered that tendons, aponeuroses, and retinacula, tendons, aponeuroses, and retinacula, and ligaments, by the way, are all made out of what? Fascia. Fascia. Yes, yes. Tendons, ligaments, aponeuroses, retinacula are all made out of what, Miss Belotic? Fascia. Yes! Tendons, aponeuroses, retinacula, and ligaments are all made out of what, Miss Stanley? Fascia. Yes! Thank you. Moving right along. Doo, 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 doo. Um, we talked about origins and insertions of muscles yesterday, right? The origin is the part that doesn't move as easily. The insertion is the part that tends to move as easily, 
right? And I use the example of the trapezius hooking to the shoulder. And we said in general, this is the origin and this is the insertion because my shoulder moves, but they do have functional reversibility, which means I can move my origin closer to my insertion. It can happen. That's functional reversibility. They can do the opposite functionally. Functional reversibility. These little highlights. Then we start to get into um, we start to get into levers of the body. Um, muscles, they say, have four properties. This will be on your test, I'm pretty sure, because they always ask about the four properties of muscle. Um, and let me explain why they're doing this. The four properties are excitation, contraction, extensibility, and elasticity. Let me tell you what that means in English. I realize those are English words, but let me tell you what that means. Excitation means that when I zap that muscle with, with a message, <coughs> it can be excited. It means the muscle is loaded and ready to be excited. When a nerve comes along and says, release some calcium ions in there, that muscle is ready to be excited. It's ready to be turned on. They are excitable. They are full of energy and ready to go. That's all it means. When they get excited, what do they do? They contract. Remember I said muscles can only do one thing? Contract. I meant one thing on their own power, by the way. If after it's done the prime mover, the agonist, if the antagonist kicks in, that muscle is extensible. It has extendability, which means it can get stretched back out. So extensibility is stretchability. And then elasticity kind of means what you might think it means. So if I take my elastic wristband here, and I let it go, it goes back to normal. And that's all it means is that after your muscles have done their thing and stuff, they fall back to normal. They fall back to the state they started in. It, you guys would have kind of already known all this. They just put words on it, right? But of course you knew that something had to tell the muscle to start doing stuff, that it could be excited. You might not have called it that, but you knew that. You knew it could only contract. And then you knew that after contracted, something else can stretch it back out again. And then you knew it would return to normal. They're just using fancy names for it, if that makes sense. Excitability, exc excitation, contraction, excitability, elasticity. But essentially, it can be stimulated, it can contract, it can be stretched out, and it can return to normal. Right? I mean, if you guys are all the same way. Right? I can go poke you, you will do something, then you can be stretched back out, and then you can return to normal. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, by the way, they call the way your muscle, we didn't get to this stuff yesterday, but we learned about the hard stuff yesterday, actually. These thin and thick filaments that slide over each other. They describe this as the sliding filament model. It's just a term people use. They call it the sliding filament mo model. I'm just trying to teach you common terms used when they talk about muscles. But you already knew it was sliding filament. So hopefully if you saw a sliding filament model, you'd be like, okay, it's the model of how your muscles contract. Sliding filament model. It's just their way of explaining how your muscles contract. Okay. This is new stuff now. Okay. La, da, 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 da. All right. You've got beautiful muscle here, right? The red stuff is the muscle itself. The black stuff is the fascia, really. Okay? This muscle is excitable, but something has to excite it. It's bored right now. 
Something has to excite it. What system of the body do you suppose is responsible for exciting, for talking to, for communicating with, for telling your muscle to contract? What system? The the nervous system. The nervous system. The, the nervous system is the telephone wires from your body, and my brain has to tell that muscle to do something. A neuron, which is the end of a kind of a nerve, a neuron here, comes down here, and it connects to some of the fibers, not all of them. Another neuron will connect to other fibers, another one will connect to other fibers. And where these neurons connect to the muscle, the junction where these neurons connect to the muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. The junction where the neuron, where the wire hooks up to the muscle, is called the neuromuscular junction, the neuron muscle junction. They just did what we do with joints, right? They said, oh, the place that where the neuron and the muscle come together is called the neuron muscular place. Well, they call it neuromuscular junction. They made it sound fancy, but it's very simple. They're just talking about where the neuron connects to the muscle. Neuromuscular junction. Uh, what does a motor in a car do? Don't overthink it. Makes the car run. Thank you. The motor makes the car go. What do your muscles do? For your, what do your skeletal muscles do for your body? Makes your body go. Thank you. Um, so... You've got all sorts of different neurons coming from your nervous system. We're not going to worry about that yet. Some are sensory ones, right? They help you feel. The ones that make muscles contract, muscles go, are called motor neurons. They're the, the nervous system that controls movement. Mo motor neurons. So these wires that go to, to go to muscle are called motor neurons. Yeah? Miss Cooper, what are the... Hi! What are the wires called that go go to the muscle? Motor Thank you, ma'am. Motor neurons. Beautiful. There's a chemical word that you probably should know called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, ACH, which is a neurotransmitter. Let me explain to you what we mean by a neurotransmitter. This nerve comes down here and releases some chemicals that, that transmit the fact that they want the muscle to contract. The chemicals are kind of the message. And so they're called neurotransmitters. They literally come off the end of the nerve and go to the muscle and tell it to contract. And those are called neurotransmitters. Use them all over your body for all sorts of stuff. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter for these motor neurons. It's the, it's the, it's the message. It's the message. It's a chemical message. So please don't over confuse this. Like you've got these wires from your nervous system tell muscles what to do. We call these motor neurons. You've got a muscle down here. The motor neurons release this stuff called ACH, which is transmitting a message. They are neurotransmitters. They come from the nerve. They're neurotransmitters. And they tell the muscle to contract. Just three things there. Motor neurons release these neurotransmitters that tell the muscle to contract. And this all happens at the neuromuscular junction. Yeah? Can you repeat that one more time? Sure. Thank you. So... Where a nerve meets a muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. There's a little gap here. And when the nerve wants to transmit the message to the muscle to contract, 
It does so by releasing a neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, ACH, and it goes floating over here and it tells the muscle to contract. Your body talks in chemicals. Your body talks in chemicals. The reason you like chocolate is because of chemicals. It releases neurotransmitters that are very similar to heroin, actually. <laughs> and you're like, that stuff's good. Um, but your body talks in transmitters. Okay, so the nerve meets the muscle, and that's called the, the neuromuscular... I don't know if yes, okay. Well, I, I'm glad you're asking, actually, Ms. Petrie, because I want to make sure we got this. So thank you for asking. So, so... Uh, what right out front of the school here, uh, where 29th Avenue kind of crosses over Bell Road, what would you call that intersection? Would you call it George? How would I know about that intersection? If I had to meet you there, what would you call that intersection where 29th Avenue meets Bell? I would explain it just like that. What would you say? Yep, you'd say the intersection of 29th Avenue and Bell. Right. Or you could even say, and I would probably understand the junction of 29th Avenue and Bell. It would be unusual, but we would know what you meant, right? Yeah. Tw junction of 29th Avenue and Bell. So the junction where a neuron, a nerve, meets a muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. Okay. It'd be kind of like if I shortened 29th Avenue and Bell and said 29 Bell. 29 Bell junction. That's all they did. They shortened those words and slammed them together. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're talking about the intersection. The neuromuscular intersection would be correct too, uh, where the nerve meets a muscle. And at that intersection, the nerve has to talk to the muscle and tell it to, to uh, contract. It has to transmit an idea. It has to transmit a message to the muscle. And it does that by sending a little chemical messenger little messenger out there, and that chemical messenger is ACH, acetylcholine. And the muscle gets acetylcholine, and it's like, i got to contract. The muscle doesn't really say, I've got to contract, but that's, right. you know, you get the idea. Yeah. I don't know if this is a good example, but there, there's some things about it I like, I just realized. Miss Petrie. If you wanted to deliver a message to me that I had to sneeze, let me explain why I'm using this example, but you couldn't talk to me, right? And you're the nerve and I'm the muscle. I would your nose, right? Yeah, or let me even give you another example because I want to put ACH in there too. I'm excitable. Like we know I can sneeze. I'm ready to sneeze, but you've got to kind of set me off. You come over and you blow pepper in my face. Okay. The pepper is ACH. Okay. Acetylcholine. I get it. I'm excitable and I sneeze. Okay. It sets me off. You okay. delivered it. You're the nerve. You delivered it. But the final message was the black pepper, the ACH. I took it in. I'm excitable and I went off. Yep. <clears throat> and, by the way, like a real muscle, I have to rest for a second before I can go off again. If you kept blowing pepper at me, I'm not going to sneeze right away every time. you got to give me a second to kind of reset. And then it will happen again, though. And, by the way, if you did it constantly, eventually I'd stop sneezing. Because eventually the muscle's completely tuckered out. It's got to rest. But that, I'm taking it too far. I think it gives everybody a pretty good idea. All right. Good job. Great questions. So, you know that neuromuscular junction we called, we talked about? The reason she had to blow the pepper? There's a gap there. There's a gap in the junction. That's why the ACH has to go across it. And we call that a synaptic gap. It's a synaptic gap. It's just a gap between, between the motor neuron and the and the motor and the, the end plate. It's just a gap at the end here. It's just a gap. It's called the synaptic gap. It's a synapse. You'll hear people talk about synapses. You actually have them there 
so that you don't accidentally fire a muscle until you're ready. So Miss Petrie's got her black pepper, but we need a little gap there to make sure that the pepper's not always around there, right? There's a little bit of space there. That's the synaptic gap, the synapse is the space in the neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction and synapse or synaptic gap are really all the same thing in this situation. Just a term. Just a term that we are throwing out. Um, if you look at the picture on the slide on the right, do you see the red little balls that are neuromuscular transmitters? The red little balls? That is ACH. That is black pepper. That is the neuromuscular junction there, and that is the synaptic gap. The neuromuscular junction and the synaptic gap are the same thing. Don't worry about all the other stuff there. The point is, that's kind of where the neuron connects to the muscle, and it sends out its little message with ACH. That's it. Don't, don't overthink it. Okay. We're not doing that. We already talked about calcium and myosin. Good. We're not doing that. Okay. So, okay. Muscles are made up of a whole bunch of muscle fibers or muscle cells, right? Please nod. Yes, muscles are made up of a whole bunch of muscle fibers or muscle cells. Would we guess there's maybe, like, let's take the bicep, just the bicep. I don't know the answer to this, by the way, but let's get at least kind of close. Is the bicep made up of maybe 10 muscle fibers, 10, 10 cells? Is it made up of maybe 100 muscle fibers? Maybe a hundred thousand. I'm sure it's at least a million. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 10 million. If I was a good teacher, I would have looked it up before this lecture, but I didn't. But let's just point out that there's a boatload of these fibers, right? So there are millions of these fibers, or at least a million, running through the muscle, right? When a motor neuron fires a fiber, does it tell it you're, you're kind of supposed to contract, contract a little bit, contract at 20%, contract at 80%, contract at 95%? Is that what it's telling it? Thank you. What, what is it telling it, Ms. Giannis? 100%, right? 100%. The muscle fiber either goes all out, right, or it does nothing. That doesn't mean the muscle goes all out. It means one fiber tries its hardest or it doesn't try at all. So the way my body controls how strong I am is by how many fibers it recruits at a time. So it has a motor neuron coming down here that might hook to maybe 10 fibers. It has another one coming down here that might hook to 100, another one to another 10, another one to 1,000 another one to one, it could be all different amounts. And my brain sends signals to certain ones to fire them. Because when you fire 10, you fire all 10. When you fire 1,000, you fire all 1,000. You could fire the 10, the 100, the 10, and the other 100. You could fire them all. You can fire the entire muscle. But it's all done by different wires. And the point is that, um, that those are motor units. A motor unit is a group of fibers that's hooked to a, a wire, to a motor neuron. It could hook anywhere from, they say two, but I say one, to 2,000 muscle fibers. Let me give you places where a motor neuron might hook to 2,000 muscle fibers. Your thigh. And you don't just have one group of 2,000 muscle fibers in there that's hooked to a motor neuron. You've got thousands of them and your brain would be like let's use 2,000 right now they're 
they're barely lifting their leg. Let's use 10 sets of 2,000. Now we're using 20,000 and it's firing those. Also I want to point out to you is this wire comes down and attaches from somewhere to two, the 2,000 muscle fibers and that's, that's a motor unit. It's a unit that works together, right? It all takes orders from one wire. Just like an army unit all takes orders from one whatever. I wasn't in the military, but one something, right? One person, one captain, right? Now, the brain's still the general. It can send out lots of captains. But that captain is in charge of two to 2,000 muscle fibers, and it either tells them attack or don't attack. It's all or nothing. And your brain works out the rest. Your brain goes, we need just a little bit. We're just going to fire this thing with two fibers. We need a lot. We're going to fire this this motor neuron that's going to 2,000, this other one that's going to 2,000, this other one that's going to 2,000, this other one that's going to 2,000. That's how it controls things. It's just literally an on-off switch. Since fibers go all or nothing, the brain decides how many motor units to bring on board. Kind of like we're in a big tug of war. And I'm losing... So I'm like, Miss Monreal, come help me too. She tries as hard as she can too. I'm like, Miss Hanson, please come help me too. She tries as hard as she can. The only way we control our power is, is by how many things we recruit. But everybody, every muscle fiber trying is trying with all its might. And a motor unit is just the neuron attached to a group of fibers that it sets off. That's its job. That's its job to turn those guys on when it's supposed to. Okay? Questions on that? Does that make sense? So some wires are attached to two light bulbs and some wires are attached to 2,000. And when you flip the light switch for the one attached to two or 2,000, two or 2,000 light bulbs go on. And if you need the room brighter, you flip on more light switches. But the light switches, the light bulbs either come on or off. They're not dimmable. Does that make sense? So what happens if they don't? If they don't what? If they don't what? If they don't connect or they don't or you can't recruit them, is there a reason why you couldn't recruit? There's all sorts of things that could happen, sure. So sure. I mean I mean there's all sorts of things that could happen. Bad things that could happen. For one thing, if my wires get cut then I can't talk to my muscles. So when people injure their back, like in a severely injured, they're paralyzed, their wires have been cut permanently. They can not only not feel stuff going up to the brain, they can't send the signal down to the brain either. Right? So my senses come up to my brain, I say, oh, that feels hot or cold or whatever. But I give my signal to my muscles, run back down my spine and go out to those muscles. And if my spine has been cut, whatever is below that area, does not, I don't have any motor neuron control of any of that stuff. So that's one thing that can happen. Other things can happen too, like a nerve could get so pinched, so much pressure on it for so long, that uh, it could kind of go dead temporarily and you might not have control. Have you ever had your arm go to sleep and you're like, can't do much with it? That's the nerve being pinched. Yeah. So that that's a, a very minor thing that could happen, but that's that could happen, sure. Or, by the way, your muscles could fatigue so much that, that even though you're, you're sending them ACH and you're telling them to fire, they're like, we don't have any energy left to fire. And they just won't fire. Like, if that's what happens to all of us. You go to the gym and you can only do so many of these bench presses and eventually you're still sending signals to do it. You're like, please give me another one. And the muscles are like, with what? I've got no energy left. You can yell at me all day long. You can blow pepper in my face all day long. You can give me all the ACH you want. I don't have anything left to give. So that would be like turning the light bulb on, but you've burned out the light bulb. Does that answer your question? Are you saying something to me, Mr. Kadars? You've got some type of background noise. I can't hear you quite right. No, it's not the lack of signal. 
It's not the lack of signal, it's the lack of your muscles to have any energy left to react to the signal. The muscle is fatigued. And by the way, part of what you're learning to do when you weight lift, part of the reason that people see so many gains the first two months that they weight lift, because when they first go into the gym, they see um, a lot of gains, um, is is because they're not only they're not only are their muscles getting stronger and learning to fatigue less, but they're getting better at muscle recruitment. Their brain is actually learning how to turn on all those motor units even better. It's learning how to fire its motor units better. It's practicing. And so it's recruiting more of the power that you already had there. After a couple of months, it's learned to fire those pretty darn well. And so then you just have to have muscle growth to get stronger. But in the beginning, you kind of actually get better at telling it to move those muscles and, and it learns more then. Yeah. All right, everybody. So neurons attached to a muscle. Neurons are just the wire from your brain. Neurons attached to a muscle at a neuromuscular junction. There's a gap there. It's called the synaptic gap. The neuron releases ACH, acetylcholine, and, and that tells the muscle to fire. These, these, motor, these neurons, these motor neurons are attached to more than one fiber usually, and that's a unit, a motor unit that moves together. Um, I already explained this. That's the all or nothing law. The all or nothing law is that when a muscle fiber fires, it gives you 100% power or nothing. That's it. And then there's recruitment, which recruitment is if I need more power, then I need to get more muscle fibers firing. Does that make sense? Somebody nod? Somebody? Thank you. That's one person. Okay. No? Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Um, I'm not trying to call you out. I just appreciate you telling me it doesn't make sense because somebody else must be feeling this way too. So... Let me think about how to explain this. Miss Hanson, if I have a light bulb and it's not on a dimmer switch, it's just on a switch, when I flip that switch, the light bulb goes on, right? And, it, and basically it goes all the way on, right? Okay. And when I flip the switch off, it goes off. If I want the room brighter, I can't turn up the light. The light bulb's giving me 100% already. The only thing I can do is flip more switches that go to more light bulbs. The light bulbs either give me all or nothing. Muscle fiber is the same way. It's all these little strings in my arm. And when I tell one string to pull, it pulls with all its might. But it's little, so my arm, my arm won't even move. So I'm like, right now I've decided I, I need to move my coffee cup. Well, my brain's really smart. It goes, one string ain't going to do that. It fires like a hundred of these things, and they all try their hardest, and that's enough. But then I decided to go to the gym, and I got one of these. <laughs> and my brain's like a hundred strings aren't going to do that. It'll fire 10,000, 10,000, and that's enough to move this. Or it'll fire every last single one. If I'm holding the heaviest weight I can possibly manage, I'm like, Aah! it fires every single string in my muscle. But the strings, the muscle fibers, the muscle cells are either on or off like a light bulb. If you want the room brighter, you got to turn on more light bulbs. There's no other way to control power. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so the muscle strings are they basically the same as the minerals because don't they do the same? They make the muscle, they go 100% into the muscles. I like what you're saying. Um, so, and by the way, I shouldn't say muscle string. By muscle string, I mean muscle fiber or muscle cell. The long things we've been learning about yesterday that contract, right? In this analogy, the muscle fiber is the light bulb. The wiring is the neuron. The light switch and the wiring is the neuron. The neuron's job is to send a signal, release some ACH and tell the muscle to fire. It's the muscle's job to actually do something. The neuron is is the messenger. It's the telephone wire literally coming down there and saying, fire. So they do operate together. You're absolutely right. That, that neuron comes, that motor neuron comes down and tells a muscle to fire or multiple muscle fibers to fire. And that's a motor unit and they do operate together. But the message comes down the wire first 
and then the muscle fires. You first flip the light switch, the electricity flows, and then the light bulb goes on. So in a neuromuscular disease, does the transmitter just like never get the message to? Yeah. So okay. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not experienced in this type of stuff, but yes, in, in neuromuscular diseases, well, for one thing, by the way, neuromuscular disease just means a nerve muscle disease, but you're right. Quite often they have to do with that, that transmission between the nerve and the muscle. Let's say you don't produce enough ACH. If you don't produce enough ACH because you have some chemical imbalance, you are going to have a very hard time getting that message there. Let's say you have a problem with those junctions. Um, that would be a problem, yes. Yeah. Did that help at all? Kind of, sort of? Okay. Okay. Ms. Petrie, how do you feel about this? I'm asking you because you're massaging your brain like it hurts. Okay. Understand it more. Okay. I do agree that there needs to be processing. Yes. 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 No, I do too. I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Cool. No, thank you for being. Yeah. No, no. And as you guys know, I'm available to process it one-on-one -on -one if we need to. So thank you. I really appreciate you explaining what's going on. Ms. Stanley, you said you're confused. Let's talk really quick. So do you know what you're confused about, or do you want me to try to just fix your confusion? I guess just fix it, because, I mean, just, it, it's not clicking. Okay. Let's look at it a different way. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I don't want you to get too tied up in the exact right word. I just want you to talk to me like I'm five years old, I'm not kidding, and just try to answer the questions, all right? So I've got a muscle here, right? Yep. Okay, cool. This muscle attaches to things on both sides. What does it attach to on both sides? The, the bone. That's it. Stop right there. Bone. It attaches to bone on both sides, right? Terrible bone. Sorry. Beautiful. Muscles can only do one thing. What's that? Contract? Yes. Muscles can only do one thing. And so when this thing contracts, what's going to happen to these bones? They're going to be like, closer together? Yes. And that's how every movement in my body happens. Everything. Everything. This muscle contracts and these two bones get closer together. Now, they had a hinge that made them get closer together in a certain way, but they got closer together. So that's pretty accurate there in that sense. Okay, cool. The muscle's got, the muscle's actually made up of little muscle cells, right? Remember we said cells make tissue? Yes. Okay, well, muscle cells make muscle tissue. That's muscle tissue right there. Muscle, muscle tissue. Yeah. So, muscle cells look like these long muscle fibers. Like that. That's actually where you get the fibers in your muscle. When you guys are eating meat, and I'm not trying to pick on you for that, when you guys are eating meat and it shreds, those are long muscle fibers. They're long muscle cells. It's groups of them, actually. It's not one cell. But that's why it's stringy, these long muscle fibers, which are long muscle cells. We said those fibers were filled with these little things that contract. Remember yesterday we said sarcomeres, they contract, they're inside the fibers. Okay, but don't worry about all that. This muscle's sitting here. I want it to contract. I need to get a message to it. Like it's not, it's not psychic. It doesn't know that I'm thinking about doing this and flexing my arm. I've got to get a message to it. I think what I'm going to do, this is me right here, happy tappy. 
I'm going to hook a wire from my brain to that muscle. Now they call that wire a neuron, a nerve, neuron nerve, but that's what all it is. It honestly is a wire. And, and you can send electricity down to it. And guess what happens when electricity comes out? It releases this it, little, what? It, I was going to say, it contracts? I don't know. Yeah. It really does. The electricity causes it to contract. Have you ever seen somebody le electrocute themselves? Yeah, and their muscles get all weird. They think like that. They're not doing that because it's painful. Pain, you do this. Ow! That's electricity coming and telling my nerves to contract. That's just an electrical impulse coming from my brain. Now, we gave all sorts of fancy names to all this stuff, which is why you got so confused. We said, hey, this wire helps a motor move so we're going to call this a motor neuron, but it's still a wire. And hey, where the neuron meets the muscle, we're going to call that, where they come together, we're going to call that a neuromuscular junction, a neuromuscular intersection. We're going to call it that. And we said, hey, there's a little gap in here. We're going to call that the synaptic gap. And hey, this electricity really lets out a little chemical messenger that tells the, the muscle to contract, and that's ACH. But, but still, it's a wire hooked to a muscle. Does that help? Yeah, it just seems like it's all pretty much the same thing. It is all the same thing. They're making it confusing with names. Now, hold, here's one last piece, though, you do need to get. This wire does not tell the whole muscle to contract. It only tells part of it to. So I do have to have other wires for other spots in the muscle. And that's very helpful because sometimes I don't need to use my whole muscle. So my brain doesn't use the whole thing. So like, like medial or lateral? Or yeah, and also just power-wise. Because those when I tell those muscle fibers, those fibers to contract, they try really hard. They use all their might. And I don't want to use all of my might all the time. So my brain just turns on 5, 10, 2,000 of them. And as I need more power, it turns on 20,000 of them. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. Isn't it like a telephone wire? It's kind of what you're saying too. It's exactly, right? exactly like a telephone wire. It's a low voltage wire that's alive, but it's a low voltage wire running through your body. Yeah. So how does that play out for us as far as, I mean, I get that we have to learn this. We obviously have to pass a test, but does it really matter to us as far as like understanding the muscle issues that might arise? Yeah. Okay, then so, I'll try to pay attention. <laughs> let me, here, let me give you a really good example why. Here's why. I, I, drew this, I drew this picture like the wires are just attached to the top of the muscle, right? They're just... But you've got fiber inside the muscle, right? So a lot of your neurons have to go through the muscle and attach the fibers inside, right? What happens if the muscle gets tight and pinches on its own neuron that's coming in to feed it? It cuts off the passageway. Mm -hmm. Cuts off the passageway. It might even cause pain, too, by the way, too, because it might be cutting off a nerve, another, a, a sensory nerve there, too. But both are correct. And when I feel pain, what do you do? If I hit you, do you relax? No. You tense up. And so now the muscle tenses up, and what does it do? It pinches on the wire more. And now the person's in a pain cycle. In fact, one of the big things we're trying to do in massage is massage those areas out so those neuromuscular junctions aren't caught in a contraction. We think that might be like trigger points and knots and things like that. Neuromuscular junctions caught in a contraction. And that's why we're teaching you this. I will be very honest with you, the ACH and the actin and the myosin and all that baloney isn't going to matter a damn bit to any of you. Um, it's nice to kind of know in the back of your head so if somebody comes up with a new idea, you can understand it. But I, but what does matter is there's wires going to the muscles and that the brain talks to them and they can get pinched and the muscle can actually pinch its own wires, the very wires it needs. That's important. So thank you for asking. Yeah. I try not to basically teach you anything in this class that doesn't kind of tie back into that stuff. Although I admit some of these words are things that I just want you to generally kind of know. You're absolutely right. I figured I just needed to know where it tied in and you yeah. did explain that. So thank you. Cool. Cool. So muscle fibers work on an all or nothing law and therefore your brain can either turn them on or turn them off. So the way it controls power is through recruitment. It either recruits one or it recruits 10 
or recruits 10,000 or recruits a million, that's how it controls power. They're either all the way on or all the way off, so it decides to turn on or off more fibers to control power. Because the little fibers are amazing. They give you full power every time. Okay. Um, I don't want to confuse you guys more, so I'm just going to kind of try to brush over a couple other things here really quickly. We've talked about ATP before. Adenosine triphosphate. It is the universal unit of energy. It's what your cells use to do work. It's what your muscular cells use to do work. Essentially, you guys turn glucose into ATP so that your muscles can work. Glucose is sugar. That's it. Sugar is energy to you. Now, you might say, well, I don't eat sugar. How do I get energy? Carbohydrates are complex sugars. Carbohydrates turn into sugars, which you then turn into ATP. But you're sugar burning machines. Does not mean you should eat sugar. <laughs> but you are sugar burning machines. That's what you're designed to do. So, um, glucose, which can also be stored as glycogen, but glucose, glycogen, your body turns into ATP, which is what your muscles use. It's the gasoline your muscles use. And we do the same thing for cars. We convert oil into gasoline so the car can use it. Your body con converts foods into sugars so that you can use them to make ATP. That's it. That's it. You convert foods into sugars. I, there are other reasons you eat food, but in this case, you so, could... I have a question. Yeah. So you turn sugar into fat, and then we get the energy? Because last time you said that we, we sugar turns into fat. If you don't use the sugar, it turns into fat. So if I eat a tiny, oh, okay. right, if I eat a tiny bit of a candy bar, I'm going to use it up during this lecture, right? But if I sit during this lecture and eat 17 candy bars, my body is like, we don't need 17 candy bars right now. If I turn those all into sugar right now, this guy will die. You actually can't have that much sugar in your bloodstream. So it converts it to fat in hopes that I will use it later. I keep hoping I'll use my fat later too when I look at my belly. It hasn't happened so far. But anyway, sugar is your main energy. And if you don't use all your main energy, you turn it into fat. And by the way, when I run out of sugar, if I don't eat for a while, I, my body converts my fat back into energy. You're absolutely right. Back into sugar, essentially. Back into ATP. So my body converts food into sugar, my body converts sugar into ATP, and my cells use ATP. ATP is sugar for my cells. Cool? And ATP is something you should know about, because it's just like, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the gasoline for your body. Do, 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 um, uh... I hope I can skip over some of this. I can. Good. Okay. I think I can. Well, all right. Um, a couple of real quick definitions to throw out at you guys about what muscles do, and I'm sorry for all the overload. It's a big chapter. You have slow twitch and fast twitch types of muscles in your body. You will hear people refer to this. Slow twitch muscles tend to be found in your lower body and they tend to be better for endurance. They tire out slower. They're not as powerful, but they tire out slower. So people with lots of slow twitch muscles in their legs make great runners. Fast twitch contract really quickly, which makes them very powerful, but they get tired very quickly. So so if you're a power lifter, it's really helpful to have fast twitch fibers. Um, you're going to really lift a couple of weights really, really heavy one or two times, and you're going to be done. That's great. But slow twitch, you're not going to be as powerful, but you're going to be able to last longer. There's no good or bad. We all have different amounts of both. You all have both. You all have both, and you have different amounts of both. But people who tend to be good marathon runners tend to have lots of slow, slow twitch fibers. People that tend to be good power lifters have lots of fast twitch fibers. That's it. It's just a term that we use. Um, 
want to talk about, since we're talking about power, um, I want to talk about isotonic and isometric contractions. Watch carefully. Am I having to contract a muscle to hold this weight up right now? Thank you, Miss Hansen. Yeah, I have to. I know nothing's happening right now, but this weight ain't holding itself up. I, if you felt my bicep right now, it's hard because I'm holding this muscle. I am contracting a muscle right now. Is the weight moving? Is my muscle length changing? No. That's an isometric contraction. Isometric contractions mean the muscle length doesn't change, but I am contracting. Just called isometrics. Okay, can I just ask a question? Sure. Um, so, but you said that our muscles are kind of push-pull contracting anyway just to stand still, correct? Or did I? No, I think... Those little things. The... Out of the little uh, the, on. the sarcomeres. No, no, no. I just thought I remembered you saying like that while we're just standing here, like oh yeah, so that oh yeah, over. yeah. Okay, so I just I will. So I'm just trying to picture the two. So you're, you're doing like, you're doing okay. isomet you're doing isometric contractions right now too. This is just a better example. It's easier to see okay. that I am obviously contracting. I'm obviously pulling to hold this weight up. But it's not going anywhere, and that's called an isometric contraction. You're doing it with your neck right now, right? You're pulling to hold your head up, but your head's not going back. It's not falling down. You're holding it still. It's an isometric okay. contraction. The muscle length is not changing. It's just holding. So that's both the same thing, though? So same concept? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are both isometric contractions. Anytime you are pulling, you're contracting, but it's not moving, that's an isometric contraction. The muscle length is not changing. Yeah? It's just a definition, guys. So the muscle's working, but it's not, there's no length changing. My muscle's going to stay this length. Yep. So then there are isotonic contractions where the muscle length is changing. It's either getting longer or shorter. If it's getting shorter, that's called a concentric contraction. Concentric contractions are what you do a lot of in the gym, right? I'm contracting and I'm winning. The muscle's getting shorter, right? And I thought I was so strong, I thought I could do two of these, right? But I can't. I'm contracting, but the muscle's getting longer because I can't hold on to these. That's an eccentric contraction <laughs> or a negative in weightlifting. So, isometric means you're contracting, but nothing's happening. Concentric means you're contracting and winning. The muscle's getting shorter. Eccentric means you're contracting, but the muscle, the, the weight is so heavy you can't hold on to it, and you're controlling it and letting it out, but your muscle's actually getting longer. You're losing the fight. They're just terms they use in kinesiology. Most of the things you do in your life... Uh, well, actually, you use all those in your life. I don't actually have a good example of that. Right now, I'm using isometric contractions to hold my neck here. Just, just enough to kind of keep it where it is, like you were talking about, Miss Monreal. Um, and believe it or not, right now I'm doing a concentric contraction, and right now I'm doing an eccentric contraction. I'm still contracting, but I'm, I'm, the muscle's getting longer. If I wasn't doing an eccentric contraction, this is what you'd see. I didn't contract, I just let it go. But I don't, we don't do that in life. We tend to control stuff. So I contract gently to control this thing going out. That's an eccentric contraction. Concentric, eccentric. Isometric. Is eccentric? Eccentric. E is that eccentric? Yeah, what about it? Is that, is that um, just an extension? In this case, it is. The fact is, the muscle that's working is getting longer.
Do you follow me? The muscle that's working, it's it's contracting. It's trying to get shorter, but it's not it's not working hard enough to do that, and the muscle is actually getting longer. Yeah, the muscle that's working is getting longer. In weightlifting, we call it a negative, right? You're trying, but you're actually losing the battle. Concentric, you're winning the battle. Isometric, you're breaking even. It's a tie. <laughs> and that very long, confusing lecture on pretty important stuff, by the way, just that you understand that nerves talk to muscles and they have a, they connect to muscles at a neuromuscular junction. Muscles can get pinched there. And when muscles are contracting, in general, you're using them to contract, to have a concentric contraction and shorten. But there are times you could be contracting and, and lengthening because you're letting something out slowly. And other times you're holding yourself still. It's an isometric contraction. All that stuff is pretty important in massage therapy. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to release the test for this chapter. Um, I think, I hope, I did not get through a couple of little concepts about fixators and stabilizers and things like that, but they're in your chapter and you're in, I don't mean this snotty, by the way, you're in college and you can read those pages. <laughs> Um, and they will make sense to you, and I, I'm happy to answer questions about them tomorrow. But I'm going to release this test because it's well within your ability. Um, I'm always available for tutoring. Always available for tutoring. I actually have an uh, appointment with somebody today to do some review and tutoring. So um, anyway, let me make sure this test is released. Um, I will also, I think I already did it, but let me check really quickly. Uh, yeah, I think, there we go. Uh, it's set up the way Ms. Torres had suggested, and we'll continue to do. You can go back to questions in it. You can only take it once, though. Uh, but it's been released. It's due by tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., and tomorrow is your Friday with me. So hang in there, and thank you all. Thank you. And I'll stay on for a few if people have questions and things like that, that they, that they need answered right now. Because I know that we kind of rush towards the end there. So I'm not going anywhere. Whew. That was a lot. Uh, 48 questions. <laughs> 40... 48 questions, yes. Is that a lot of questions? It's big. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Yeah. I only jog when you come for people. Oh. I love having you in class. It's a good partnership. Yeah, bye. Bye bye. Mr. Kandaris, hey. do you have your... Yeah, I, I figured you did. What's up, buddy? Well, I'm a, so he, he could, I mean, head injuries can be kind of serious. What, what's hurting? He said it, it's hurting on the inside. Oh, I thought you said his head. You said his hip. Oh, hip, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Is there a lot of swelling there? Got it. It probably does. 
He might even have internal bruising. He actually might have hit his hip and it might have punched inside the hip joint itself. Anyway, general massage. Just try to loosen up his hips. You okay. should you should be fine. That sounds pretty safe to me. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right, bye. Bye bye. Any questions right now, Miss Hanson? All right. Are we still going to meet today? Okay, so, but we're still going to meet today, you think? Okay, so I'll see you at, at 3.30. Just come to the same link, and I will be there, and then we can also go through any of this, or what we can do whatever. Okay. Thank you. I got to I gotta go if that's okay. Yeah, no worries. All right, bye-bye. Oh, shoot. Okay.